continue to study uh, our study on, on the Bible in a nutshell. You say, what, what is that all about? We are trying to get a synopsis of this book, which uh, I'm going to tell you right now, there is no way. Um, we spent a lot of time in Genesis, right? We did. And we're going to fly through here. And I have to tell you, it, it almost, uh, there's a part of me that's bothered by the fact that you have to fly through. There's so much stuff. Uh, this, is a, this is a book that is like no other. And uh, because it's God's, it's written by the Lord. And you can say, well, how many times has someone ever told you, well, the Bible is written by man? You ever heard someone say that? All right. Well, God did use men to physically write. That is true. Uh, but go, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1 this morning. Before we get into this, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number... Uh, 19. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 19. And this is something that comes up a lot when you deal with people. Uh, you know, I've had people, you know, try to debate about things. And, and usually what it always comes back to is, is the Bible truly a book that can be, I mean, that's what it, it was. That, can it be trusted? Is it God's word or is it just man's? All right. Now, I will just challenge you a little bit, and I want you to, to, to open, people about being open-minded. Uh, isn't that funny? <laughs> In the day and age in which we live, the people that say they're open-minded are usually the least open-minded people, all right? And I'll get this going back here in a second, but look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, so what is the point here? The point is this. This book claims to be inspired by God, so it either is or it isn't. All right, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, uh, I, I believe that the Bible is a good book. Look, if the Bible is not the, the word of God, you understand that God's a liar? You understand that? If the Bible is not divinely inspired by God, if the Bible is not, as, as, as you just read here, the claim that it makes is that it's not of any private interpretation. I can't tell you how many times I've shown someone, and they say, well, what do you think about this? And I'll say, well, the Bible says this. And they'll say, well, that's your interpretation. I said, no, 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 I just read you what, what God said. I'm not going to interpret anything. Uh, I'm just going to read what it says. And you know, as a Christian, you know what you ought to be able to do? You ought to be able to say, here's what the Bible says. Not what I think about it. And not what I was taught about it, but here's what it says. All right? And so uh, go back to the, the book of Exodus, if you would, this morning. We're going to be continuing our study. Exodus. Let's see here. And i got to get things situated up here. All right. Get this hooked up again. Exodus. And we're going to be, uh, again, sort of taking a, a real quick trip through here. Uh, let's get this going. Get connected here? Okay. Um, Exodus, so what we're talking about is the children of Israel leaving uh, the land of Egypt. All right? So as they leave the land of Egypt, uh, what do we know about it? All right? Chapter number 14, if you're to pop over there. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is this. You're going to move quickly. We're not going to actually read any verses. I just want you to look and be familiar with the passages, okay? Chapter number 14 is uh, where you read about uh, uh, Moses and the children of Israel crossing through the Red Sea. All right? Um, chapter number 15, and by the way, it's not the Reed Sea, all right? And, and just because somebody calls themselves a scholar does not mean that they are more of an authority on history than God. If God tells us that they went through the Red Sea, guess what? They went through the Red Sea. Uh, it is not a miracle, guys. By the way, I have these scholars that talk about this, uh, what they'll mention is they'll mention that, well, they really crossed through the Reed Sea. And what that is, that's an attempt to try to take away from the miracle that took place. The Reed Sea, the water comes up to about here. Guys, it's not miraculous to walk through water that's about here, all right? Uh, it was a miracle because it was an actual sea that God parted. And here's, here's the deal. If you don't believe that, then don't believe anything in the Bible. How, okay, so God can speak the world into existence, but he can't open up a sea? I mean, God, God can divinely inspire words. God can become a man and die for your sins, and get you to heaven, and transport you from here to there in the moment, and took of an eye, explain that. If you're not going to believe that, don't believe anything. <laughs> All right? What you have is you're dealing with history. 
You're dealing with history. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu um, actually uh, brought up uh, uh, Moses uh, when he came and spoke to our Congress. By the way, little known fact, uh, Moses actually holds the Ten Commandments there in the chamber of the house. And so when he's giving his speech, he points to Moses back there. There's probably a lot of Americans who don't even know that that is in our chamber. <laughs> All right, you got the Ten Commandments and the Bible influencing all kinds of things. They don't realize that, trying to get rid of it. But, uh, but he mentions Moses, all right? Go to chapter 15, Exodus chapter 15. And what you have is you've got a song that's sung. And that's interesting because, pop over to Revelation chapter number 15. That's interesting because in the tribulation, what ends up happening, and I mentioned this last week, Pharaoh's a great picture of the Antichrist. Uh, he persecutes the people of God, and he's called a great dragon, just like Satan is in Revelation chapter 12. He persecutes the nation of God, the people of Israel, and as they're fleeing, he, he chases them. As they're fleeing where? Into the wilderness. Do you understand? Jesus Christ prophesies in Matthew chapter 24 that when they see certain things happen in Jerusalem, that the people of Israel are to flee where? To the wilderness. And guess what happens? Revelation chapter 12, Satan follows them, and you know what he does? He casts a flood on them. You know what the Lord does? He dries it up. He opens up the earth and gets rid of that flood. Isn't that interesting how it correlates with Exodus? All right? the, the, you know what's, what is so interesting? When someone says, this is a book written by man, I, I just go, you haven't read it. You haven't read it. You have not read this thing from cover to cover. When you read this thing from cover to cover, here's another thing. Let me point this out to you. When's the last time you read a book written by man where all he does, he points out all his flaws? You know what men do when they write books? Look at this man. He was such a great man, and he established this nation, and what a great king. And, and, and when someone writes about, about their autobiography, the struggles of the human spirit, and how they overcame all these things, God says, you're just a bunch of dirty sinners, and you're lost without me. This book is not like other people's books, all right? Revelation chapter 15, look here. And uh, uh, Revelation chapter 15, look if you would at verse number 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. We're not going to get into all that this is talking about, but let's suffice it to say, this is during the time of the tribulation, all right? And for in them is filled up the wrath of God, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and then they had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. How do they get victory over them? In the tribulation, by not taking the mark, you know what happens? Off with your head. Now, now, let me just say this. this is, again, I, I, I'm trying to contain myself. I get excited, okay? But, but here's, here's why I, when someone says this is just you know, a book written by man, even 50 years ago when you would read the book of, of Revelation and talk about what the Bible says is going to happen in the Great Tribulation, how if people don't take the mark, they're going to have their heads chopped off, everybody would say, oh, that's, that, our society would never allow that. Are you guys watching what's going on on YouTube? Now, right now, you go, oh, yeah, but the world's detesting it. Wait until Israel is pinned into a corner and everyone says, off with their heads. When that happens, it's all going to go. That's, that's it, guys. When, and, and I'll tell you right now, you better pray for our country. Pray for our country. You know, I know some of you don't want me to be political here. And I'm not trying to be. I could care less if someone's Democrat, Republican, black, white, Asian from Mars. I could care less. But if you say you stand up, you're going to represent my country and you're going to turn on Israel, oh, Man, you are, you're, doing a big, you're making a big mistake. And uh, so pray for our nation, all right? But look here, if you would, at verse number, uh, verse number three. So these people have, have given up their lives. They've been martyrs for the Lord Jesus Christ during the time of the tribulation. And look what it says that they sing in verse three. And they sing the song of Moses. You know what song that is? If you go back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, you read what that song actually is. And what it is, is that the Lord overthrew the horse and the rider into the sea. He drowned Pharaoh and his army, and God delivered them through that. So what are they saying when they get to heaven? God is going to destroy the armies uh, that have gathered against his people, and God is going to bring vengeance. And so uh, what they're doing here, it's interesting how back, I mean, the second book in the Bible ties with the last book of the Bible, 1500 or so B.C. to 2000 plus, and it's all connected. It's all connected, all right? Go back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 17, and we're going to run through this very, very quickly, okay? Exodus chapter 17, and you'll read there about being at Mount Horeb and how uh, they got water out of a rock, 
Another great, interesting miracle there. All right? And uh, Moses, this thing takes place actually twice. The first time, God tells him uh, to go ahead and smite the rock. All right? But the second time, the second time that, that they are encountered into a place where they have no water, God tells Moses to speak to the rock. Remember that? And because Moses, in his anger, because of the children of Israel, he gets angry and he smites the rock the second time. And water does come out. You still get the same result, but it wasn't on God's way. And uh, so you say, what do you learn from that? Well, the first time Jesus Christ came, he came to give his life a ransom for many. But the next time he comes, he's not going to be smitten. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite, all right? Chapter 19 and 20, you read about uh, Moses receiving the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Uh, all right, you, you might remember uh, the president of the NRA, Charlton Heston, you know, getting the commandments from God there in... And uh, what was that movie called? Is it called Ten Commandments? Is it the Ten Commandments or is it? Anybody know? I think it's called the Ten Commandments. Yeah, Ten Commandments. I think it's called the Ten Commandments. And I know that they, they just come out with another Exodus movie. But, uh, and they show that every year at Easter. I've never understood. I like it. And that's fine. I guess the Passover land, maybe that's the connection. Uh, but uh, I, I need you to understand this. We talk about the Adamic covenant, which is uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And you know what happens there? God says, I, you can have anything you want, perfect fellowship with me, just don't eat that tree. What does man do? He eats the tree. He eats of the tree. So fellowship's broken. All right, then you have uh, the Abrahamic covenant. This is an, an unconditional covenant God makes with Abraham. And he says, I'm going to give you all this land, and that covenant is still in effect to this day. All right? Then you have the, the Mosaic covenant, and that is the law. That's where God says, hey, I'm giving you my law. Uh, and if you, if you keep my law, you'll be blessed, and you'll stay in your land, and you'll enjoy the blessings of being in your own promised land. But if you don't, you'll be scattered. There's a condition on that, on that, on that covenant. And, of course, look at uh, chapter 32, Exodus chapter 32. Uh, <laughs> not too long after the law is given, Moses comes down from the mountain, and uh, the people have already backslidden pretty quickly. Isn't that something? Uh, they said... Uh, and it sounds a little bit like Dr. Seuss. We wot not. <laughs> it means they didn't know. We wot not what has become of Moses. All right? And uh, they didn't know. They, they basically said this. They said, we can't see Moses anymore. We don't know what happened to him. We need a God. So they make one. They make a golden calf. And, and let me just encourage you, have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't just mean be saved. I mean beyond that, have your own personal fellowship. Because if your convictions are based on a man, guess what happens when that man is gone? There goes your convictions. That's what happened to the people of Israel. All right, from chapters 33 to 40, the rest of that time is spent talking about the tabernacle. And uh, what's interesting is there's 40 chapters in Exodus, and that number 40 is associated with testing in the Bible. And so you know what they do? They wander in the wilderness for 40 years. All right, what is that? A time of testing, all right? So after, after uh, they leave the land of, of Egypt, and they, they are on that journey, and they're, they're wandering in the wilderness. Eventually, Moses passes on, all right? And uh, when Moses passes on, there's another man that basically takes his place, if you will, as a military leader, and his name is Joshua. And, and Joshua, the name Joshua means Jehovah saves. Joshua is the Old Testament form of the New Testament form of Jesus. One's in Hebrew, one's in Greek. Same, same name, basically, all right? So it's very interesting because of a number of reasons, all right? Uh, I want you to consider this. Joshua is a great picture of Jesus Christ. He comes after the law and brings the people into rest. Isn't that what the Lord does? He comes after the law and he brings rest to his people and he brings others into that fold. Thank God for that. All right? Joshua is a man of war. The Bible says of the Lord in Exodus chapter 15, the Lord is a man of war. Now, let me just stop real quickly here, because I feel the need to do this in a very uh, pluralistic uh, society where people try to equivocate uh, chopping people's heads off in the name of Allah with what happened in the Old Testament when the Jews go into the Promised Land, all right? Let me just clarify some things, all right? Um, if you know anything about history, and, and most people don't, I'm not saying it to be offensive, but most people don't know about the history of the land of Canaan before the Jews went in there. Do you know what they're doing? They're... The people, the Canaanites in that land, they're offering children up for human sacrifices. Uh, the, and I won't go into great detail because we have mixed company, but the sexual immorality, the things that went on are, I can't even repeat. I'm not just talking about homosexuality. I'm going way beyond that, way beyond that. And uh, all kinds of 
wicked things were happening in those lands. You know what God says when he tells the children of Israel to go in there? He tells them to wipe them out. Now, some people have a problem with that. <gasps> God, that's genocide. Um, you have to understand what's going on in those places. All right? Now, you compare that with some tourists going to see a museum and some guy, Halakba! What, what do those people do? They're tourists. What do they do? Nothing. You can't, you can't make them the same thing, guys. I'm sorry, all right? You can't, you can't do that. No, the media tries to make them the same, but they're not, all right? Uh, so Joshua goes in, and God basically says, look, I'm going to give you this promised land, but if you guys follow the same gods that these folks did, you're going to experience the same thing that they're experiencing now. You will be cast out of the land, and they do eventually go through that, all right? Now, Joshua is told to cross that river Jordan. That's interesting. Go back to Joshua chapter number 1. And what you have up here, you have a map of the tribes, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, all right? And uh, you get a map of the tribes and how they're laid out geographically there uh, in the land of Canaan, all right? Joshua chapter number one. What's your, let, me, let me tell you why the Bible cannot be allowed in the United Nations Assembly, all right? And one of the reasons why is you find out that... Uh, the land that's being fought over right now over there in Israel, quote-unquote Palestine, uh, it's been their land for a long time. It was their land way before 1948. All right? 1948 is when the world recognized the sovereign state of Israel once again. And I heard a preacher say it like this, World War I. Now, some of you guys get bored with history. I'm sorry. But you have to learn history to understand what the Bible's, what's all connected here, right? In World War I, God prepared the land for the Jew to come back. And if you learn anything about World War I, they started af after World War I is when they started basically reconfiguring the Middle East. All right? World War II got the Jew ready to go back to his land. You see, what happened in World War II? Six million Jews died at the hand of Adolf Hitler's Holocaust. So they go back to their land, and that's when the world recognizes the sovereign state of Israel. Guys, I got news for you. God did not need America or Western nations or Europe or anybody else to recognize them as a nation. God already has for thousands of years. All right. So what you're reading about in Joshua is them going in and, and taking the land that God promised them. Joshua chapter 1, look if you would at verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan thou and all this, all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place... Now let me ask you a question before you read this. Do you believe the Bible? Okay. If you believe the Bible, I can settle... The, uh, matter of fact, let me read something to you real quickly here. Um, let's see if I can get it here. Bear with me. Yeah, this is from the Jerusalem Post, if I can get it to pull up. All right? And uh, basically, if it doesn't pull up, I'll, I'll give you the gist of it. Uh, I won't take too much time. Uh, basically, uh, our president is saying after the re-election of uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu that the uh, road map to peace... Uh, in Israel is, is unclear. No, it's not. Let them have their land. Done. I just solved it. Who wants to give me billions of dollars? I just solved the world's problem, okay? It's their land. Give it to them. Now, uh, here's, here's basically, guys, let me ask you a question. Let, let's just, let's, as an American, as an American, if, uh, okay, let's say if Canada, God bless Canadians, they never cause any trouble, man. They're good, you know, really. If you're watching this and you're from Canada, I love you. Uh, but uh, let's say that Canada, you know, wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what, part of New York used to be ours. We're taking it back. <laughs> Would any Americans be like, you know what, really? Yeah. No, there would probably be some college-educated professor out there who's so smart, he's a fool, that would say, you know what, you know, really, we're, we're, we should be a, a, a pluralistic society. We should, we should be open-minded. We should, no, it's our land. Back off. Why, do, why is this such a problem? Have you guys looked at a map of the Middle East? Okay, look, let me just give you, this is like the size of New Jersey. Have you looked at the rest of the Middle East? All the Arab countries? I'm thinking to myself, hey, guys, Dubai looks pretty nice. You Palestinians that want a nice place, go to Dubai. It's a nice place. They got skyscrapers and they got all kinds of technology. Why is it that the entire world looks at a place the size of New Jersey and says, yep, give your land up? Does that make any sense to anybody? No, it doesn't. The only way it can make sense, here's another thing that doesn't make sense. All right, here you are on the far left, women's liberation. All right, 
Now, don't throw any stones at me, ladies. Just listen to what I'm saying. All right, you got women's rights, and, you know, we should be treated fairly and equally, and you chauvinistic Bible preachers that say, wives, submit to your husbands, you know, off with your heads, get out of here, we hate you. But Islam's good. Have you guys looked at the middle, ladies, you want to trade your American citizenship for Saudi Arabia? How does that make sense? How do you get, how do you reconcile those? So the only way to reconcile them is through the Bible. The only way to even, how does it make sense to someone that's over here on the far left and open-minded and liberal embraces Islam over Christianity? That doesn't make sense. Unless you have a common enemy. And they got it. You say, why is that? Because this book's right, and God said that they wouldn't be reckoned among the nations. They'd stick out like a sore thumb, and they do. All right, now look, if you would, at verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Now God lays it out here. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, that's west, shall be your coast. All right? That's, uh, that's, over, that's over here. That's what he's talking about. Let's see over here. All right, so basically, uh, God says, I laid out a map for my people. Um, and now uh, the world may not recognize it. They may not accept it, but God did. And so what you're reading about in the book of Joshua is them going into that land and taking the land that God promised them. That's why it's called the promised land. All right, chapter 6, for, for, uh, again, just hop over there real quickly. That's where you read about Jericho. All right, and contrary to Veggie Tales doctrine, they did not throw Slurpees at them. Okay, all right, that is not what happened. I, I, you know, Veggie Tales are fun, but every once in a while they're way out there, man. Um, so what happens is they march around the city so many times, and then the walls phew, come down. Now look at chapter number six. All right, and I think uh, I don't know who it was, brother Joey Anderson. Someone showed me this before. This is pretty neat. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the number of the mark of the beast? Anybody remember? 666, right? Okay. Joshua is what book in the Bible? Fifth or sixth? Sixth book. Chapter number six in verse five. So what is that? That's 665. Right before you get to 666, right? Look at verse five. It shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then they say when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's coming with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and, and there's going to be a shout. All right? And it says, The wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall what? And it's going to happen in the rapture right before the 666. We're going to go up. You can say that's a coincidence if you want to. I don't, I don't accept that. I don't, I don't take that. I think that's, that's a neat little thing in the Bible, how God lays out the books and the chapters. And, and, and that's why you don't mess with it. You don't mess with the chapters and numbers. and all. Leave it the way it is. God has it there for a reason, all right? All right, chapter number 7. Chapter 7. There's a, the, the Battle of Jericho, chapter 6, chapter 7. Uh, you could maybe make the, the case that, uh, and, and this happens sometimes. Sometimes when God blesses us, we can get a little cocky thinking that we did something great. You know, a church grows, and we look at how great we are. Or, you know, you get a raise at work, and you're making twice as much as you used to, and now you don't need God as much anymore. Does that sound familiar? Ever been there? All right. And uh, so they, they win this great battle at Jericho. Then they go to Ai. And Ai is a tiny place compared to Jericho. It's really a blip on the radar. And you know what happens? They get beat. Now, the story is this. Uh, chapter number 6, in verse number 18 or verse 17 the city shall be accursed even it and all that are there into the lord only rahab the harlot shall live she and all that are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent and this is talking about uh jericho and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of israel a curse and trouble it so what happens uh, a guy named achan takes of the accursed thing, you say, well, what is it? Well, in the passage, you find out it's, a, it's, a, it's gold and a garment. Now you go, what? Lord, really? Why would you be so upset about that? Now go back to Deuteronomy. To understand why, go back to Deuteronomy real quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I'm not going to lie to you. I, for years, wondered the same thing until I put the, connected the dots uh, uh, together. I always wondered why the Lord had said. Now you can make the case, well, God said not to do it, then don't. Okay, fine. But why was it even called an accursed thing? Why was it wrong to take a piece of gold in a Babylonian garment? Right? Uh, chapter number 7, Deuteronomy 20, uh, chapter 7, and look at verse 24. 
And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand. This is what happens with Joshua. And thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou destroy them. The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire their silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Now, why was it cursed? Because it was connected with worshiping false gods. That was the trouble. And you can read that there in Deuteronomy chapter 7, in those verses we just read. And so the Lord tells them, hey, even if it looks pretty and shiny and you want it, Christian, there's a great lesson in that for you. The lesson is, just because something feels right and looks right doesn't mean it is. If God's not in it, you, you better stay away from it. All right? All right, go back to uh, chapter number 7. What ends up happening with uh, Achan, he loses his life. And what ends up happening is, after that, uh, the people are able to go back to Ai, and they actually win the battle. All right? Now, in chapter, let's see here, chapter number 12, again, for sake of time, we're flying through here. Uh, if you read verses 9, chapter 12, verses 9 through 24, uh, there's a list of 31 kings that are smitten by Joshua. All right? And again, uh, got to consider this. What happens when Jesus Christ comes back in Revelation chapter 19? The, the, the armies that have gathered there in the valley of Megiddo, we call it Armageddon, you know what he does? He destroys them, right? And he establishes his kingdom. So again, what are we seeing in Joshua? A, a picture, again, of the Lord. All right? But it lists out the kings by name. You know what's great about this? History. When people say, I don't believe the Bible. I had this happen a couple weeks ago. I think I may have told some of you. Uh, I don't know if I was who I was with door knocking. It wasn't you. Maybe it was you. I don't know. Maybe. It may have been you. I don't remember who it was. Anyways, it was one of the guys. And uh, this guy goes, well, I can't believe the Bible. I said, well, what do you mean you can't believe the Bible? Well, you know, it doesn't line up uh, scientifically. I said, well, what about history? Well, what about it? I said, well, after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, over 500 people saw him and it's attested for in writing. And uh, Well, that's, that's, you know, yeah, but they could, have, they could have lied about that. I said, you believe in George Washington, don't you? Well, yeah. I said, why do you believe in him? Well, because of history, I said, and they couldn't have lied about that. You see how people are with the Bible? It's funny, isn't it? It's funny. All right, so here you're reading about history, and it gives names of kings that existed, and archaeologists attest to these names as well. All right, in chapter 18, the tabernacle set up, and at the end of Joshua, go to Joshua chapter 24, Joshua dies. Joshua is the, the leader, the military leader, if you will, that passes away. And uh, Eliezer, who is the high priest, the son of Aaron, he also dies. And uh, the Bible says that they are buried in Mount Ephraim. All right, so what happens after Joshua? Well, what happens after Joshua is, is very interesting because really what it is, it, it's a lot like our lives. You have peace in your life. You're serving God. Things are good. Um, sort of get comfortable, complacent with that because things are good. You don't really need God as much as you did before. You see, when you're in your promised land and you're no longer wandering in the desert in the backside of nowhere with no 7-Eleven, no air conditioning, nothing else, no Starbucks, right? All right, when you're in the backside, you need God. But when you're in the promised land, things are good. Well, you can get to God later, right? And so they do evil in the sight of the Lord. God punishes them. They're enslaved into the nations around them. Just like a Christian gets backslidden, gets stuck in the world, if you will. Then they cry out to God. You know what God does? He raises up a judge, and he delivers them. And then they have peace. And then the cycle starts again. <laughs> Doesn't that sound familiar? I mean, if we're honest this morning, we've all sort of gone through the judge's cycle before. All right? If you've been saved for any amount of time. But here's some major characteristics of the time of the judges you need to consider. All right? The first thing there is there's no real authority. Uh, go to Judges. Uh, let's see here, chapter number 17. Go to 17. Judges chapter 17. And they have no head. There's no authority. There's no king. There's no leader. There's no nothing. All right? And so God brings up judges for a period of time, but then they die off, and then people go back into apostasy. And then he raises up another judge, and then they do right. And then that person dies, and they go back into apostasy. 
All right. Uh, Judges chapter number 17. Look, if you would, at verse number 6. In those days there was no king. Now, God mentions this a few times. You're going to see this. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know what happens when everybody does what they think is right in their own eyes? Chaos. That's what happened during the time of Judges. Do you know? If you talk to most people today, well, that's your opinion. I'll have mine, you have yours, right? The thing that people don't like is something that says, here's the final authority. What you think is immaterial and what I think is immaterial. Because this came from God. So if God has this to say, something to say about it, then you probably ought to listen to what he says. That's what people don't like. As, as long as I can say, well, this is just my opinion about stuff, heaven, hell, you know, whatever, you choose your own path. Now, as an American, you know what I tell people? Hey, it's America. Free will, free choice, man. Believe whatever you want to believe. But I'll also, it's also my job as a Christian to tell you if you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire without God, without hope. You say, why? Because I believe this book. And if I didn't believe this book, I'd be golfing or I'd be fishing. Or I'd be doing something else. I wouldn't be here right now. I can't stand to, to think about a minister who stands before people and tells them that these stories in the Old Testament and the, these miracles, they're just allegorical. They didn't really happen. If I believed that, I wouldn't be here. I, you know what I'd say? My theme in life would simply be this. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But if you believe this book, a lot of consequence happens with what you do with the truth that's given to you. All right? And so what you have in this time of Israel, look at chapter 18, verse 1, is you have no authority. You have no final authority. And Christian, you should never be without a final authority. This book should be your final authority. All right, Judges chapter 18, look at verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in front of that day. All their inheritance had not fallen to them among the tribes of Israel. And uh, what ends up happening in this story, you're going to read about uh, idolatry and false gods being brought into the nation of Israel. Why? Because every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. Look at chapter number 19. Go to chapter 19. Let me ask you a very simple question. Have you ever done something that you just knew was the right thing to do and you just felt it was right and 10 years later you go, I was an idiot? I have. I have. And the longer I live, the more I look back on things and go, that was dumb. <laughs> but I was sure. I was sure. Now, usually when I was sure that it was right, I didn't have, I'm talking about life decisions where I did not even necessarily go to the Bible. I didn't necessarily pray about it. I just knew it was, I didn't even need to pray because I just knew it was right. That was dumb. <laughs> now I look back on some of those decisions, I go, man, I shouldn't have done that. Learn from it, but you know what's better to do? It's better to learn before you make the mistake. And you can spare yourself a lot of trouble by getting in this book and keeping it in your final authority. Look at chapter 19 and verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. There was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, if you've read through your Bible and you've read across the story, it's very disturbing. Because there's no king in the land, there's no authority, and every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. You know what ends up happening to her? She ends up getting abused by a bunch of men, and uh, it's very tragic, very, very sad story. All right? uh, you know, what, another thing I appreciate about the Bible, it's very true to human nature in life. It exposes some things about man without God, when man's without God and how he does things. And, uh, and so in chapter 19, you read about a very tragic story that takes place as a result of every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. All right, look at chapter 21. Chapter 21. So there's no authority. That's one thing we see. There's no king. Every man is his own authority. All right. Chapter number 21, look if you would at verse number 25. The last verse in this book, in the book of Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And again, the, the, that's God's commentary on chaos. All right? And so every man has his own authority. And you, so there's three things. There's no final authority except for everyone's own opinion. And you see this cycle that takes place over and over and over. Now there's some judges to know by name, some interesting ju uh, judges. Ehud in, in uh, chapter number 3. Uh, Deborah, chapters 4 and 5. Gideon, chapters 6 through 8. You know what I love about Gideon? The fact that uh, God comes to him and says, Thou mighty man of valor. You know what he's doing when, he, when God calls him a mighty man of valor? He's, he's working the fields at night 
because he's scared that the people that are ruling their land will see him doing what he's doing. You're not supposed to have any threshing instruments. He's doing all this stuff he's not supposed to be doing. He's scared for his life, and he's working at night. And God comes to him and says, Thou mighty man of valor. He's looking around going, Who? <laughs> right? Uh, uh, Jephthah in chapter 11 through 12. Uh, Samson, of course, chapters 13 through 16. If I could give uh, three books of the Bible... To every young man that's about to go to college in America, I give him Ecclesiastes because he'd find out that life without God is vanity. And you're going to try the drugs and the parties and the, and the sex and the this and the that. And you're going to come out, at the end, you're just going to go, it's all vain. Without God, empty. I give him Proverbs because, you know, let's face it, guys, we're, we're just a bunch of idiots when we're young, aren't we? Right? And God, I'm talking to us, guys, ladies. It's okay. I'm talking to the guys right now, okay? All right? <laughs> We're just a bunch of boneheads. We really are. I look back at some of the things that I, that I did, and I man, what was I thinking? I can tell you some of the pranks that I did, even at my church growing up. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, is, it is the mercy of God. The only thing that got me through some of that was the fact that when I got in trouble, I got in trouble with the son of my teacher. So that, anyways, I don't want to go into all that. All right, but I give him Proverbs to learn some wisdom. And I give him Judges, chapter 13 through 16, to learn about... <laughs> Uh, mistakes you don't want to make with women. <laughs> and Samson made him, didn't he? Blessed of God, God's power was on him, but man, he just couldn't stay away from the thing that God said, I don't want you messing with. And uh, there's great lessons to be learned there as well for God's people as it relates to Samson's life. Don't marry unbelievers. I'll go a step further. Don't just not marry unbelievers. I've told my daughters, you can tell your kids whatever you want to. I've told them, marry someone who's like-minded. Why am I going to spend uh, 18, 19, 20, 21 years of their life instilling them godly character that lines up with the book and then say, well, just marry whoever and throw all that away? It's a waste. It's a waste. Now, what she chooses to do, what Bella and Emma choose, it's going to be on them, but I'm going to do my part to ensure as much as I can, all right, that they understand the need to marry someone that's like-minded. Samson, uh, he didn't. All right. And during this time of Judges, what also takes place is a, an interesting story about a, a lady named Ruth. All right. Now, if you read the book of Ruth, you might almost think that it's, uh, if you're not familiar with the entire Bible, it may almost come off as an insignificant love story about this lady from Moab, and she marries this older guy who's a Jew, and, you know, what does it have to do with anything? Uh, well, one thing to keep in mind is... Uh, that it does take place during the time of the judges. Look, if you would, at, at uh, Ruth chapter number 1. Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, and comes right after uh, Judges. Joshua judges Ruth. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. I also need you to understand that from the time that the children of Israel left Egypt to here, this is several, uh, a couple hundred years. All right, so we're in, in about 40 minutes, we're covering a couple hundred years of time, all right? And so it says here that it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So you understand the context historically of when Ruth takes place. It takes place during the time of judges, all right? Uh, another thing that's interesting here, look at uh, verse number one. It says that uh, there was a famine in the land, all right? And uh, notice that in uh, verse number one, a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So what happens here is a man named Elimelech, and we're going to talk about the different characters here, the cast. You have Elimelech, you have Naomi, uh, who is uh, Elimelech's uh, wife. You have Malon and Chilion. Those are the two sons of Elimelech and Naomi. And then the other major character is Ruth, and then there's also Boaz. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, but starting off, Elimelech, Naomi, and the two sons go into the land of, of Moab. You know why they go there? They go to sojourn. All right, there's a famine in the land. They are never supposed to stay long term. They're supposed to go and get fed while they need to, while there's a famine in their land, and then come back to their land. All right, now, why is that important? Well, we are in this world, Christian, but we're not of it. You know what's going to happen tomorrow morning? The alarm's going to go off, and you're going to get ready. You're going to go to work. 
Nothing wrong with that. You know what you're doing there? You ought to see this. You ought to see work and your responsibilities in the world and paying bills and raising a family as sojourning. <laughs> this isn't it forever, guys. All right? The, the forever's on the other side. All right? And so you know what they do? They stay for a long time. They stay long enough that Malon and Chilion get married. And as a matter of fact, Ruth is one of the wives of the son. So, so what happens is this. Naomi hears that God has visited the land of, of her nativity, of Bethlehem, Judah, and she goes, you know what? My husband Elimelech, Elimelech dies. Malon and Chilion, they die. They stay long enough for the boys to get, to ra to get raised in Moab, to marry Moabite wives, and for Elimelech and the boys to die. That's a long time. So what should have just been, you know, like Gilgan's Island, a three-hour tour, ends up being, you know, a lifetime in Moab. And it shouldn't have been that way. And as a result, what you have, look at chapter 1 and verse number uh, 20. This is why when you, when you skip the Old Testament, like, okay, it's not really important, it's just Old Testament stuff, you miss out on all these things, all right? Uh, Ruth chapter 1, look at verse 20. When she comes back, all right, and she comes back to Bethlehem, Judah, where she's from, it says in verse 20, she said to them, call me not Naomi. It means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. She says, uh, call me Mara. You know what it means? Bitter. It's uh, the Old Testament form of Mary, by the way. Mara, Mary. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now look at, now, now just think about this. When you find yourself backslidden and in the world, you know what's easy to do? It's easy to blame God for the things that went wrong in your life. Instead of saying, I did this to myself. She says, don't call me Naomi, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. Why? Because look what God did to me. <laughs> I went out full, and that's how you're going to leave the presence of God. You always leave full. And the Lord hath brought me home again empty. When the world is done with you, you're empty. <laughs> and it says, why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Now, I've got to make this point. There is no social security. There's no social uh, uh, safety nets for anybody. There's no disability. There's no unemployment. <laughs> All right? Uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, you know, survivor's benefits when your husband dies. Basically, you're on your own, sister. And so she comes back to the land. And, and as she does that, she tries to convince Ruth she convinces the other daughter-in-law, all right? She convinces her, and she says, look, you're not going to want to come with me. Uh, I don't have any other sons for you to marry. I don't have a life for you where we're going. We're going back to where I came from, and there's nothing there that I remember anymore. So you might as well go back to your God, go back to your people. You know what Ruth does? She goes, no, I want to follow you, and I want to follow your God, and I want to be one of your people. And uh, Ruth, as we're going to see, is a very, very interesting picture of the church, all right? So what you have is you've got Moab, which the Bible calls God's wash pot there, uh, close to the land of Edom. You have Bethlehem. Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. That's where they go back to. It's a picture of God's provision. Think about this. That's where the Lord provides us the bread of life. Where was Jesus Christ born? Bethlehem, right? In the city of David, right? All right, and uh, Ruth is a picture of the church, and we're going to see why here in a second. And Boaz, he's the last character that we're going to talk about. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the story. Um, they are, they are uh, really, it's not looked upon very highly for the Jew to marry a Gentile in this time. And so what ends up happening is Ruth goes out to, to work in the, the barley fields, all right, and she goes to collect uh, uh, grain and goes to work in the fields, and and Boaz takes note of her, and he makes sure the young men treat her respectfully and don't, you know, mess with her, leave her alone. She's doing good and, and right. And uh, Ruth, by the law standards, is supposed to be, at least be given or offered to the brother of uh, Elimelech or Elimelech's family. And because the first guy in line basically says, I don't want to mar my inheritance with a Gentile. I don't want to do that. Boaz says, I'll take her. You know what the Lord did with the church? <laughs> he took a bunch of Gentiles and said, I'll take them. And uh, he takes a Gentile bride, which is what the church is, 
And, and you know what ends up happening? Go, if you would, to, to the end of the, of the book, Ruth chapter number four. Why is this story important? Because it's really a bridge between the judges and the kings, and I'm going to explain why. And we'll end on this note. Ruth 4, verse 17, uh, or verse 16, Naomi took the child, and this is the child that, that uh, Boaz and Ruth have as a result of their marriage. Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There's a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of who? So you know what you have? You have a Gentile that is allowed to come into the line of David, which eventually is the line of Jesus Christ. So it's an important story. Four chapters, but man, there's a lot in those four chapters. So uh, what we're going to get into next week is, is exactly uh, what, where this sort of leaves off. We're going to be talking about the time of the kings and the kingdom and what the Lord has to say about that. So we'll go ahead and stop there. And I uh, hope this is a blessing to you. We just covered... Oh, uh, let's see here. About five, almost 500 years of history right there, all right, in 40 minutes. So uh, we'll be looking to do again a little bit more.